The B-52 Stratofortress is one of the military's oldest and most iconic planes. It's already spent more than 60 years in the air, and the Air Force plans to keep these bombers flying for decades more, perhaps until they're almost 100 years old. It can fly up to 50,000 feet for almost 9,000 miles, even longer with aerial refueling, and has a bristling arsenal it can carry. Conventional bombs, precision-guided munitions, cruise missiles, nuclear weapons, and even in-development hypersonic weapons. The Air Force is planning for the B-52 to make up a key portion of its future bomber fleet, alongside the B-21 Raider stealth bomber that's coming online in the next few years. With the B-1 Lancer and B-2 Spirit on the way to retirement, this will be the most sweeping revamp of the U.S. bomber fleet in a generation. But the B-52 is showing its age and needs some major upgrades, top to bottom, if it's going to last until around 2060. On the way are new engines, avionics, radar, weapons, displays, and more, all the way to new wheels and brakes. So how is the Air Force planning to keep a 100-year-old bomber flying and ready to fight? I recently visited Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana to find out. For Military Times and Defense News, I'm Stephen Losey, and this is What's New with the B-52. One of our first stops as we learned about the B-52 was to visit Major General Jason Armagost, commander of the 8th Air Force who oversees the B-52 fleet. He gave us a sense of why these bombers will be so important to the Air Force in decades to come and how they're planning to keep them flying. It's a different approach to engineering that made available that ability to fort to fly that long because um, you know, a good example is maybe the B-2 or, or now a, a more advanced version of that is the B-21 with models-based systems engineering. Um, one of the things that you benefit from in models-based systems engineering is you say, I think that this design will behave a certain way and then when I test it, you validate the model itself. You don't validate even almost your, your physical object. And by doing that, what you're, you're building out a case where you say, this will behave a certain way and it's very predictable to me. That was not available in, in, in the early 50s when they were really refining the design of the B-52. And so, uh, margins for safety, uh, margins for uh, materials, uh, you know, we had different alloys and materials then. And so, um, as a result of that, uh, it used to be the saying, uh, my grandparents drove big giant cars, you know, they liked American steel, right? B-52 is kind of the American steel version of an airplane, and it's uh, what we're going to gain in efficiency on the engines uh, is, is only available to us because of the strength of the frame, the strength uh, of the, it's like the C-130, right? The same, almost a similar story to the C-130, where it's very hard to replace something that is built in a way that is that enduring and that endurable, and so you end up replacing engines and you replace avionics. And, and sensors and, and communication systems to hang on that frame. We have uh, fathers and sons or fathers and daughters um, flying B-52s, the same tail numbers, uh, that in the future, um, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren will fly. Armagost also outlined how he saw the B-52 being used in the years ahead, alongside the Air Force's next stealth bomber, the B-21 Raider. When Global Strike Command moves to that two bomber force, what's that going to mean on, as far as how Global Strike tasks its missions? So one of the things kind of in that, in that learning environment that we really, really focus on is, is at the very highest principled level is joint command and control. And so command and control plays out through our forces, but it also plays out through the combatant commands. And so uh, I think we're learning how to best do that, and but we, so what do we know now about what that future operating environment will have or require is a different approach to communications and data and the sharing of that um, and, and the resiliency of that, frankly, in denied environments, whether it's a denied information environment or a denied air environment. The B-21 with the B-52J is a very powerful integrated force, and so uh, how I would see 
against near-peer adversaries operations being conducted has more to do with how we integrate those two things rather than how we pick individual actions for individual platforms. But keeping a plane as old as the B-52 in the air and able to fight a modern war is quite a challenge. For example, how do you find parts for planes old enough to have flown missions in the Vietnam War? Here's Colonel David Miller to tell us what it takes. All weapon systems, new and old, come with challenges. Um, when you take a look at some of the older weapon systems, I think the largest challenge is really the defense industrial base. The slow atrophy over a long period of time of capabilities that exist um, outside of, of, outside of the, the service member's um, purview. When you start to look at the commercial sector, um, trying to entice vendors to want to continue to make very old, very difficult parts in small numbers is a challenge. With the size of fleet, it's 10% of what it used to be. We had over 744 aircraft, now we're down to 76 aircraft. So we don't need, need as many of those parts as we did in the past. It requires an older technology to go get it, and the, the vendor base is just drying up with, the, with an appetite to do that kind of workforce. So the, the largest challenge is the defense industrial base in some regards. Can you give me an example of some, um, some of the parts that where the manufacturing source has dried up, companies have gone out of business, even like small things, small things to big things. Well, Absolutely. Know, so let me take this to the TF-33 engine. Um, it has been around for a very long time, but getting parts for the TF-33 is very difficult. Even as aggressive as we have been on the supply chain management side and the program office side of finding vendors. And when we go to the F-130 engine, the Rolls-Royce new engine, um, that's gonna be, um, a, uh, I would say not an evolutionary gain for our, for our maintainers, but a revolutionary gain. The leap between the two engines can be so significant that um, uh, what we're buying into is an aircraft that's not going to have to go through core maintenance very often, if at all. The biggest headaches for maintainers come from the B-52's original 1960s era engines. Many of the companies that originally made parts for those TF-33 engines went out of business years ago. But on the way to replace them, a set of new Rolls-Royce F-130 engines that will bring improved efficiency, range, and a fresh supply chain of spare parts due to be delivered to the Air Force later this decade. What are some of the most common um, issues you see when uh, a B-52 comes back from a mission or comes into the shop or needs to be maintained? What's, what's the most common troubleshooting things? Uh, so there's, there's a variety of things. Uh, you can go uh, a week and the aircraft come down fine every time or every flight you could have a different issue. So uh, the engines are one piece that uh, shares a commonality uh, with many of the, the brakes we see. However, with, with uh, upgrades coming, uh, we're excited for that. I think the reliability uh, is the big thing that we're excited about because that lets us focus on other, other things that, that may come up. Uh, other issues with the aircraft. Until those new engines arrive, however, airmen must do whatever it takes to keep the current ones operational. A job that falls to people like Technical Sergeant Bonnie Carter, who helps run the supply shop for B-52 parts in Barksdale. So first, maintenance identifies the, the parts that they require. We then go into our system, we see where we can source this part. Hopefully, it's available in our warehouses. If it's not, then we go to higher levels to see outside of this, this space where this part is possibly stored. If it's not able to be acquired in a timely manner, they will then turn to cannibalization to acquire this part or other avenues such as local manufacturer. So turning to the back shop to, if able, if the capabilities exist, to manufacture this part ourselves. So long as the Air Force can keep finding ways to maintain its B-52s, it can keep them in the air. But they also need to train new generations of airmen to fly them. And when you put students up in the air controlling more than 92 tons of hardware, anything can happen. Join me in our next episode to get a look at some of the training required for air crews assigned to America's Stratofortress fleet.